Welcome to the Palestine Podcast, produced by the Ireland-Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Hi everyone, I hope you're all safe and healthy. Thank you for joining our policy lab today. Over the past four years, under the Trump administration, we have witnessed major changes to U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Palestine, from, U from moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, to recognizing the annexation of the Jordan Valley, Israeli settlements, and the occupied Golan Heights, to waging an economic war on Palestinians by defunding the UNRWA and putting an end to American aid to Palestinians, the Trump administration has violated international law and supported supported Israel in the continuation of its ongoing structural violence against Palestinians. With the imminent U.S. presidential elections, what possibilities lie ahead for the U.S. relationship to Palestine? And what role can Palestinians play in influencing the upcoming U.S. administration's policies? To discuss these questions, we are very pleased to have with us today Nadia Hijab and Hatem Bazian. Nadia Hijab is co-founder and board president of Al Shabaka. She served as its executive director between 2011 and March 20. 18, and she's a writer, public speaker, and media commentator, and my former boss. And Hatem Bazian is co-founder and professor of theology at Zaytuna College in the U.S., and is a lecturer at the University of California, Berkeley, and national chair of American Muslims for Palestine. And I am Noor Arafeh, a PhD student at the University of Oxford and former policy fellow of Al Shabaka in Palestine. So Hatem, I'd like to start with you and ask a basic question. What do you think would be the difference between a Trump administration and a Biden administration on Palestine? Well, first, uh, thank you for having us, Noor, in this uh, conversation. And also thanks to Shebaka for bringing a lot of us who work on Palestine uh, in a form uh, to continue to delve into Palestine. I say Palestine is an information intensive cause where you have to follow the details, not only in relations to Palestine, but uh, almost every part of the world continue to engage with Palestine in one way or the other. Uh, as to the question, what will be the difference between uh, Biden and Trump? Uh, we always tend to say in the US election, uh, we're trying to vote for the lesser of two evil. Uh, but when it comes to the Palestine, it's really the lesser of the evil might be measured in millimeters, uh, not in inches or in feet in terms of difference. Uh, but to specifically speak about Trump and then move to uh, Biden, uh, just today there was a news item that Sheldon Adelson uh, has spent close to $250 million dollars uh, to try to get Trump uh, elected. Uh, now, if we know, Sheldon Adelson uh, has been behind the push for the move of the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, last week, also, uh, uh, he pushed for the U.S. to sign an agreement with Israel to allow uh, the settlements to have scientific cooperation, which means that they will be able to get grant resources rather than actually being uh, a, an area where it's a violation of international law. So the United States signing this agreement uh, also provides uh, this uh, ability of Israel to use the settlements as part of its uh, uh, 1948 territory. Uh, the third, we also saw that the push for Israel to have a veto power on the sales of weapons, uh, especially advanced weapons to various countries of the Middle East. Let me first say I'm not in favor of selling weapons to anyone. I'm an, a I'm a vehement uh, opponent of the military industrial complex, and I wouldn't care whether somebody is getting F-16, F-20, or F-35. For me, these are death economies. But nevertheless, to actually allow Israel to have a veto power on the U.S. Uh, military uh, sales is also raises uh, the question uh, as it relates to Trump and where is his policies relative to Palestine. Uh, we already saw his nod toward the, uh, po the possible annexation of the Jordan Valley. Uh, 
uh, and accepting the annexation of the Golan Heights. If we look at his administration, uh, Trump's administration, he's beholden to the evangelical right. Uh, and if for those who know the evangelical right in the United States, uh, it's millenarian, it's engaged in speculative theology, preparing for the second coming. And as such, in uh, one of his one of his speeches, Trump said, "I moved to the I moved the embassy for uh, the evangelists." So that's the nature of uh, Trump's uh, policy as it relates to Palestine. I would I would think that he will continue in that track, knowing all the personalities that are around him. When it comes to Biden. Uh, one was also one has to think that uh, he would carry the same type of foreign policy team that comes from Obama. Uh, many of those who are in his uh, foreign policy uh, team that is working in multiple groups. I just uh, thinking that he has about a thousand individuals now as part of his policy uh, advisory team divided into working groups of 50 plus working groups, including uh, working group in, on the Palestine-Israel front, on Iraq, on Syria, on Afghanistan, but also on, uh, on the European front, uh, on the various commands, whether the Africa commands, the Middle East command, the China Sea command. So he has a whole set of uh, foreign policy teams that are working in this area. When it comes to the Palestine-Israel track, I would say he would lean on both the Obama team, but the Obama team also was inherited from the Clinton team. So what essentially you're gonna get is a continuation possibly of the 20 plus years of utter uh, failure and complete disregard of the Palestinian rights, uh, systematic rights to sovereignty, rights to uh, ending the occupation, and uh, the ability to press Israel in any meaningful way to alter its behavior. Uh, having said that, uh, indication that uh, Biden is going to make certain moves that might be seen as positive as it relates to Palestine. I know for a fact that he made certain commitments uh, that he will restore the funding for UNRWA, which is the United Nations uh, Relief Work Agency that funds the Palestinian refugees, whether it's in Gaza, Lebanon, Jordan, and the West Bank. So that's a firm commitment from him. And in my evaluation of that is that uh, Trump's, uh, Biden's action will be a low cost, but will give him what you call the ability to go out publicly and to say that we have restored our relationship with the Palestinians, that we are being even-handed. Uh, that's, again, uh, his uh, statement or his approach. The second part, I think he will reopen the PLO uh, office um, uh, in Washington, D.C., and that's likewise is a low-cost, high return in terms of public positioning vis-a-vis -vis the Biden uh, administration if they come. As far as the Jerusalem uh, embassy, I don't expect Biden or the established Democrats to actually walk back uh, uh, Trump's movement of the embassy from Tel Aviv to uh, Jerusalem, knowing that the uh, congressional resolutions and Senate resolutions for uh, urging the move of the embassy to uh, Jerusalem has been on the books for quite a long time where each president would, would ask for a waiver uh, for the uh, movement of the embassy uh, to Jerusalem. So I don't expect anything in, in that regard. Now, would we see Biden uh, being more assertive in relation to the settlement? That is still, I would say, is subject to what type of pressure uh, uh, Palestinian grassroots in the U.S as well as our allies from the progressive Jewish community and other organizations, whether they actually will muster that type of pressure. And I think in here we have the possible uh, wiggle room to begin to mount a sustained effort to push Biden on the settlement issues. 
and also to begin to uh, highlight certain uh, violations of Israel as it relates to uh, its treatments of the Palestinians. So though that for me, there will be the differences. Trump is unmovable by pressure. Biden is susceptible to pressure if the progressive forces uh, are able to mount a challenge uh, to establish Democrats who are beholden to supporting Israel. You have to remember that Haim Saban is also a major funder on the Democratic side of the uh, pro-Israel Zionist infrastructure. So you have both Sheldon Adelson and Haim Saban, in essence, are making sure that at both sides of the political equation, uh, that they have Israel's back, uh, no matter which administration come to the fore. So that's how I see a Biden administration versus a Trump's administration moving forward. Thank you so much, Captain, for this, um, uh, for your view on um, the difference between the two administrations on Palestine. I want us now to turn to where the Palestinian leadership fits in this uh, picture. Nadia, how do you view the role played by the Palestinian uh, government with respect to the U.S. and the elections so far? And more importantly, what... Uh, could be done? What are the sources of power that Palestinians can capitalize on to advance matters uh, for themselves? Uh, thank you, Noor. I, uh, and thanks for that introduction. It's, it's good to be with you both. Uh, and I agree wholeheartedly with everything uh, Hatem has said so far. It's uh, a really a source of great distress for, for Palestinians, including myself, that the Palestinian leadership has for decades pinned its hopes on the U.S. to help achieve a deal that would fulfill our rights. Um, and they've allowed the U.S. to uh, monopolize the role of broker, even though it has demonstrated time and again that it privileges is Israel in, in that relationship through aid, through trade, through veto power at the U.N., um, despite the slight differences between the Democrats and the Republicans. Um, you might, despite all the evidence to the contrary, have believed that the U.S. was a quote-unquote honest broker at the start of the, uh, the Palestinian-Israeli peace process back in the 1990s, in the early 90s. But now, can you really still uh, believe that and pin your hopes on the U.S.? Yet just the other day, uh, the Palestinian uh, prime minister said a democratic victory by the presidential nominee, Joe Biden, would raise prospects of a peace deal even though Biden and his vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris have made their pro-Israel credentials crystal clear. And in fact, the Palestinian leadership has put on hold their conciliation uh, plans between uh, the conciliation initiative between the Palestinian factions, especially Fatah and Hamas, that were sparked by the UAE and Bahrain deals with Israel, um, which should have happened a long time ago, but they were finally pushed by the uh, by the uh, 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 collapse of the Arab support, effectively, for the Palestinians uh, in the Gulf. So um, those plans that, that were being prepared in early September and throughout September were supposed to have uh, brought Hamas and Fatah together and all Palestinian factions, as well as elections, as well as revived the PLO and so on. So, of course, the Palestinians aren't the only ones waiting and hedging their bets for the outcome of the U.S. elections. Most of the world is. Um, Boris Johnson here in Britain, where I'm based, uh, is said to be hoping for a Trump victory to get a better position uh, himself in negotiations with the EU. The difference between the Palestinians and the UK, uh, if one could uh, put it uh, that way, if, is that despite the self-inflicted wounds of Brexit in the UK and a mismanaged economy, the UK still has some sources of power and resources to, the, to bring to the table. By contrast, the Palestinian leadership has largely ignored the need to bring power to the table. The thinking seems to have been, if you have a seat at the negotiating table, you can win your goals. By contrast, Israel and its supporters have for decades worked 24-7 to build up their power, win new allies, grow their economy, colonize, shift the discourse, reshape the international legal framework, and impose themselves on the regional and international scene. Today, Israel has so much power that countries are actually going to Israel to access the United States. 
And still it works 24 seven to build and maintain its power. By contrast, and I, I'm sorry, I keep saying by contrast, but the contrasts are huge. <laughs> the Palestinian leadership, which should be working 24 seven to build sources of power had let, has let its power drain away, especially since the Oslo Accords were signed in 1993. And in fact, it seems that there's little understanding of what those sources of power might even be and how to invest in them. Of course, things are very hard today with the pandemic and for vulnerable groups under uh, military occupation, discrimination and exile. But COVID, you'll notice, hasn't stopped Israel, uh, which has just announced a bunch of, of new settlements. So what might some of those sources of power that Palestinians have be? And we should recognize that Palestinians do have power. People tend to think of armed resistance when they begin to think about power. But in fact, in the Israeli-Palestinian context, this is the arena where Palestinians are weakest and Israel is strongest. Although the capacity for self-defense is of course important. But as I said, the PLO let many sources of power fade away after Oslo. And in fact, most of the sources of power that Palestinians have today are being exercised by civil society. These make Israel pay a price for the occupation through boycotts, divestment, and sanctions that could one day lead to sanctions. They keep the Palestinian voice and narrative loud and strong in the mainstream media and through books and, uh, and uh, film and in social media. They're forming alliances with other groups, in other words, intersectionality to push Palestinian rights. They're pushing to preserve and uphold international law, which is crucial for our cause. Uh, all of this sh should not only be done by civil society, it should also be done by uh, a smart and strategic leadership. A big missing piece here is re-engaging the entire Palestinian people in developing and advancing a unified struggle along, along cl uh, clear goals, clear goals that are understood and accepted by everyone. The existing leadership was inching towards this long overdue goal, as I said, uh, in September, but it's still working out with hollowed out political parties that have existed since the beginning of time. So, uh, of course, I exaggerate here, but they've, they've been around for a long time and they really don't have uh, much, uh, much effect, much clout. With a unified national movement, we would be able to bring a lot more pressure to bear on the international community to support, support us. I want to just uh, do a little shout out for Shabaka to say that we've tackled some of these issues in a recent report titled Reclaiming the PLO, Reengaging the Youth. Uh, do check it out. And we have an upcoming study about how the PLO diplomatic core and beyond that the PLO itself can re-engage with Palestinian diaspora communities. So keep an eye out for that as well. Back to you, Noor. Yeah, thank you, uh, Nadia, for your critical assessment on the role of the Palestinian leadership. Um, if we now turn to the Palestinian diaspora, uh, there have been efforts in the diaspora to organize and play a more leading role in shaping Palestinian politics. Um, Hatem, how would you assess uh, these efforts, especially as we're based in the U.S., and what more do you think could be done in the future? That's an, an important question. Uh, and if I may answer this by first saying uh, that we have committed some error in the past, and I think what we need is to take stock of those errors, is that we attempted to replicate the uh, Palestinian body politic inside Palestine and in the region in working on Palestine in the West, in the United States, and I would say in, in Europe. And what it did, it created a fragmentation and also uh, prevented us from being effective in actually having functional, uh, both functional leadership as well functional strategy that targets systematically what we need to be effective on. I would have to say that the post Oslo generation of Palestinian, both activists and organizations, have taken stock of those uh, drawbacks and errors in strategy and approach. And I'm very, really optimistic in relations to the new generation and the uh, innovation 
the skill, the tenacity, uh, and the perseverance uh, opposite monumental challenges. Uh, uh, and I would possibly mention uh, SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine, which is not only Palestinian, I think people need to be cognizant that SJP was born immediately after the Gulf War, where the number of Palestinians that were coming from abroad completely collapsed because as we know, many Palestinians who were coming to study in the United States were funded from Palestinians who worked in the Gulf or their families sent them uh, from Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, or the occupied territories, but their support was from family members that were working in the Gulf. But the Gulf War resulted in the displacement of Palestinians and there needed to be a different way to think about Palestine. So that created intersectionality uh, of the work on Palestine in the U.S. Uh, built on the anti-war movement against the Gulf War, but also at the success and culmination of the anti-apartheid movement and the Central American Solidarity Movement. So those three or four branches coalesced in order to bring about a different type of political engagement. And it took a while uh, for this to gel and to begin to actually begin to have a strategy of what are the centers of effective political work. It's not surprising now that almost in every U.S. college campus, Palestine is the central issue that is there and have been able to link up on any given campus. And again, whether you're talking about Columbia, Brown University, uh, Yale, uh, Boston, Berkeley, UCLA, you're, you're speaking about 70 different organizations that coalesce where the Palestine work is central to this and as such has been effective. The other is also the emergence of specialization among uh, uh, pro-Palestine organization. Uh, the idea that one group or one individual or one segment can do it all, that belongs to a different era completely. So I, I'm really very appreciative of the work as Shabaka uh, does. They really constructed their lane of engaging in the uh, bringing together the intellectual uh, field of Palestinian uh, scholars, academics, as well as activists to have a conversation uh, in a systematic way, issuing reports and so on. So you don't need to do everything. You have Palestine Legal that likewise came out to deal with how to defend Palestinians on the legal front, whether it's college campuses or in, in other places. I speak about AMP, American Muslims for Palestine, we saw the normalization or the emergence of Muslim Zionists and we needed to respond as a way to continue to consolidate the support that historically been there in relations to uh, the Palestine cause vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim population, Muslim world. We're speaking about al auda that took on the theme of how to advocate and work for al auda and as a concept and as an idea and push it and work with it. So this is a really a very important. Then you have also the track of beginning to do the lobbying effort and the advocacy effort. And I think this is in the beginning stage of it. So I'm really very confident in there. The unfortunate thing is our leadership, both back home and the, those who have official capacity, uh, even to say they're missing in action would be still giving them what you call a reward for it. They're not there to begin with. They don't recognize the action they actually often have been uh, acting to counter possibly some of these successful initiatives. I remember occasions where we have the PDS, the Boycott Divestment Sanction, actually very successfully, and we get somebody from the official uh, representation of the Palestinians wanting to actually have a normalization event in places where the successful PDS among various sectors of the community, they want to bring themselves possibly the Israeli uh, ambassador or council general or another, what you call uh, hag of, uh, uh, of pro-Israel and to bring them and they want us to actually co-sponsor. I said, that's just like a non-starter for us. So we have to actually continue to assert the successful strategy that has been developing. And I think those are successful uh, elements that we need to hold on and continue to push.
Uh, thank you, um, Hatem. I would just like to remind our audience that I'm asking one last question to Nadia. So please uh, feel free to ask any question you have for Hatem, Nadia, or both. Um, uh, at the, just use the section, ask a question at the bottom of the screen. And I'll start um, addressing your questions uh, to our speakers in, in a few minutes. Um, Nadia, I want us to draw on what Hatem was just talking about and the shift in the U.S. on the question of Palestine. We've also been seeing more democratic candidates having a more critical and progressive uh, perspective that somewhat takes Palestine into account. And Hatem told us more about the efforts, especially by, for example, SJLP, SJP, and other uh, student organizations in um, leading this, uh, this shift. Um, but broadly speaking, what other drivers um, do you think um, um, have played a role in uh, contributing uh, to this change, specifically what has been the role of other grassroots movements or civil society um, organizations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Noor. Um, and uh, thank you, Hatem, again, because uh, uh, you really touched on some of the, the critical things which I'm going to expand <clears throat> and build on. I do want to say that the shift on Palestine in the U.S. is real. And I think uh, it, it has uh, taken, I don't think we should underestimate how long and how uh, hard the work has been. Um, this this present shift has taken at least 20 years to get to where we are uh, today. Um, and uh, I think, uh, uh, as, as Hatem said at the beginning, one of the main difference between Trump and uh, differences between Trump and Biden is that if it's Biden, we will have another day, we'll live to fight another day or to advocate our cause another day because we have a very good movement in place. Um, so it's it's really 20 years uh, uh, since the second intifada, really. That's when the, this uh, uh, started building on, uh, as Hatem said, uh, past movements in the U.S. Um, but but there was a growth of newly established uh, Palestinian American and Jewish American as well groups, as well as by churches and other organizations that were all advocating for Palestinian rights. And at a certain point, we had to start with a huge amount of education and advocacy. As a friend of mine and, and fellow activist said at the time, you know, in, in the US, you don't only have to uh, educate people or, or explain about Palestinian rights, you have to uneducate and then uh, provide education about Palestinian rights because there had been so much disinformation and misinformation. So, um, the the uh, uh, the as I said, Israel's uh, really draconian response to the Second Intifada drove home the importance of reigniting many of the groups that had died away with Oslo or the efforts that faded away with Oslo. In addition to some of the organizations that uh, had to mention, I want to highlight the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, which I co-founded, actually in. Uh, uh, in uh, the, uh, at the at the turn of the century, um, and uh, uh, the the uh, in addition to SJP, which is doing fantastic work, and which went through a bit of a slump at a certain point, but then came back really strong. Um, uh, and uh, AMP, which Hatem co-founded, which he leads, uh, ch churches uh, uh, for uh, Friends of Sabil and uh, uh, other organizations that, that focus on churches. It's a very, very diverse movement that we have. Uh, we have organizations, uh, as Hatem said, you can't pack it all in one organization, but we have several organizations that are each tackling a, a key part, like in the Institute for Middle East Understanding, which is focused on media, organizations and getting the, the Palestinian narrative out. You have actual media organizations like the Electronic Intifada and Mondo Weiss. You have the uh, growth uh, of Jewish Voice for Peace into an organization that is, is very hard now to shut down and uh, and uh, be told to shut up and and that that have uh, 
that uphold Palestinian rights in the same way that Palestinians define them. You have a more recently, if not now, which is focused on the occupation, which was set up. Um, a lot of these organizations uh, got, grew much stronger and were set up in response uh, to Israeli invasions of Gaza, the very uh, horrendous invasions between uh, 2008 and, and 2014. Um, uh, what I want to flag is that many of these organizations are now sustainable because they are very professionally run and professionally staffed and, and managed uh, and do a lot of fundraising to sustain. Um, and this is really important for our movement because a lot of time activists think, okay, let's get together. We have a, a plan. Let's just get out and do it. And then they get tired and it fades away. Uh, Hatem mentioned uh, Palestine Legal, which is crucial because it enables the activists to sustain their work and not to be shut down by uh, Israeli propaganda efforts. Um, so I think, uh, as had to mention briefly, a, a further strengthening of the movement has been the growing intersectionality that brings groups together across causes, uh, Black, Indigenous, Palestinian, and uh, other, um, other areas and causes. This received a really big push after the police killing of uh, the unarmed Black teenager, Michael Brown, in St. Louis, Missouri, and led to the Black Lives Movement and rapid growth of Palestinian Black solidarity uh, and the understanding of the parallels between Israel's treatment of Palestinians and the US treatment of the Black community. So um, when there began to be a move in the Democratic Party itself to reshift the focus on, on human rights and what people wanted, because the Democratic Party is, is very conservative, really. Uh, uh, it's moved to the right uh, uh, a lot in the last uh, years. And uh, there's, there's now been an effort to refocus it on um, people's rights and uh, getting uh, uh, health care for all, getting a minimum wage, um, and in those areas. And so when this, uh, this shift happened and was pushed by Bernie Sanders and Democratic Social for America, and you had these young and progressive representatives in the House, Palestine became um, a very important part of the picture. And many of you will remember that in previous era, uh, people would talk about PEPs, uh, which was shorthand for progressive except for Palestine. You can't do that today. Uh, this the, It has been completely reversed. If you're progressive, you talk about Palestine. You work for Palestine. That's what's going on in the States today. There's so much that can be done. I hope we have the space to do it. We will have to push for the space to do it, um, especially uh, given the Supreme Court's shift to the right, uh, especially the, the laws Israel has had passed, uh, uh, supporters of Israel have had passed uh, at the state and national level to, to close down uh, free speech. Um, I think there's more that the Palestinian uh, uh, supporters and Palestinian uh, pro-Palestinian groups could do, which is reach out to the progressive center, like women's groups, like environmental groups, and develop alliances through those. I mean, not to stick to just a comfortable space where everybody uh, agrees, um, because we really are in, uh, 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 we have to advocate not just for our rights, but for our lives. And um, uh, Israel is working 24 seven to criminalize, criminalize BDS and free speech. Um, so we can speak more about this during the Q&A. So I'll just leave it there. Thank you so much, Nadia and Hatem, uh, for um, your insights. I will now turn to the Q&A. Um, we actually have many questions um, building on um, the different issues you addressed. And Hatem, I would like to start with you. We have a question with the highest number of votes. Um, and it's basically, what sort of realistic, effective pressure can grassroots apply given the imbalance of power in Washington regarding power Palestine and Israel? Well, I'm a person that works in decolonial uh, struggle. And the basic assumption of decolonial struggle is that you don't accept the real and realistic, because what is the meaning of real and realistic other than accepting the status quo? I would say that uh, we have been under the most uh, stressful uh, period in the history of Palestine, but also in the history of the world, at least in the past 20 years, if not. 
uh, if somebody looked at the world in 1948, Palestinians should have been what you call erased from the map. We shouldn't be speak, talking about people still remembering Yaffa, Akka, Haifa, Ramle, uh, Nasra, saying of uh, Nablus, Ramallah, Der Dibwan. Right? We should have been erased. So the fact is that we have been able to reshape history, contrary to pro-Israel uh, advocates and thinkers that they think that they are the only uh, important and meaningful things. Uh, and I know that we often are being introduced as being supporting actors in our own life. Uh, we are the story in our own life and we are the narrative in our own life. As far as strategy, I would say that pro-Israel advocates and organizations have been on the wrong side of history and they're on the wrong side of history right now. They've been on the wrong side of history in South Africa. Uh, they were on the wrong side of history in the Central America in supporting the death squads in El Salvador and providing training for them. They were on the wrong side of history in, in actually supporting the Iraq war. And I would say they're on the wrong side of history today by embracing whether it's Trump or attempting to push Biden in a different direction. And they're on the wrong side of history because they're embracing Islamophobia as the only strategy for them to continue to advocate in the U.S. Having said that, I would still say to people who want to work that BDS is an important tool for us to work. It's an important part of our tactical work, both in the United States and in Europe. And we have been able to register major victories across uh, the United States. We have won challenges in the court. I won my own challenge in, in Arizona. Uh, in, in, in state of Arizona law, we had a challenge in, in, in Texas, we have a challenge in Kansas, meaning that pro-Israel uh, advocates wanted to actually silence our voices and silence our fundamental right to be able to boycott. And I said, uh, you know, I welcome you. If you want to make the debate about Palestine, about free speech, welcome. Actually, you're going to lose. Not that I want to give them any what you call consultation they don't have to send me consultation fee but this is a losing strategy on their part because they're using power which is a sign that they have lost the ability to advocate for the position anyone that's speaking on israel's positions today is advocating solely solely on the principle of power and using power as a way either to silence demonize or push out and that is not a winnable strategy at all so i'm very optimistic again in relations to where Palestine work in the United States, as well as many parts of Europe, uh, because they have actually set up themselves on the wrong side of history. The second part, I think, as uh, Nadia have mentioned, that also we have a, a very strong emergence of a progressive wing of the Jewish community that is no longer can be isolated into few voices that the pro-Israel and Zionists used to call them self-hating Jews. These are progressive individuals that have organizations, that have advocacy, that they are partnering with the Palestinians for a different future and different horizon. That's a change in dynamics that has taken place. And I know somebody is speaking about J Street. The fact that those that Zionism created a left wing of Zionism to try to advocate for me is a sign that the dam has already broken and they're trying to block it with few holes by trying to play a progressive while actually supporting status quo. Again, this is for me is a sign that where you are heading. What for me for the Palestinians and those who are adv advocating Palestine is to actually continue to look forward and look up and continue to build your alliances and build the networks that are there because the future horizon is for you and change is coming. You just have to continue to do the systematic, deliberate work in order to bring about change. And politicians are the last to jump on the train. The train has already passed. It already left the, the station, the train of freedom, the train of justice, the train of fairness for the Palestinian has left the station. Don't worry about whether Boris Johnson, Trump or Biden are going to jump on the train. Most likely they're going to try to get somebody to give them a hitch to catch up with the train. The train is already moving and moving faster as we speak. 
Thank you so much, um, Hatem, for your passionate uh, response. Um, Nadia, there's a question on the PLO or the PA. Um, it's from uh, Jaffa, and I had like different uh, people from the audience also try to respond. Um, when will the PLO or PA realize that the two-state solution is but an illusion? Uh, yeah, first of all, I want to thank Hatem. I mean, because it's such an energizing, positive <laughs> um, pitch or, or actually message that we really need to carry forward during what uh, I hope are not uh, um, uh, very difficult days ahead. Uh, so, so thank you for that invigorating uh, uh, pitch. Um, the the real the two state solution being meaningless and being dead and being having a last nail in the coffin of you know keeps coming up again and again and again. Let's ask ourselves um, what was the problem about the two state solution? Why was it not realized? Um, is there something intrinsically wrong about the two state solution? I would say if you had a state where all were equal and where uh, 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 Palestinian rights, the right to return, uh, uh, the right to equality, and, and Palestinian rights were realized, but Palestinian self-determination was accept, uh, expressed in a state, uh, a two-state solution, that's fine. If Palestinian self-determination is expressed in a one-state solution, which is in the whole land of Palestine, that's fine. What has been missing is the power to make it happen. The, there has been no sustained uh, source of, of consistent strategy, power, et cetera, to achieve the two-state solution. That was the problem with the two-state solution, not that the thing itself uh, uh, was necessarily uh, a failure. Um, it may be... Uh, it may be difficult to, to achieve now, but, uh, well, it was difficult to achieve. It's, it's even more difficult to achieve. But I would say don't throw it out because it brings with it some sources of power. I'm fixated on sources of power. If you have some sources of power through the two states, so you, through having a state, through having a statehood status, which Israel hates, by the way, so you have access to the International Criminal Court. You can take cases to the International Criminal Court. Uh, you can hold other countries, you, you know, accountable. You can use your statehood statehood status for something. Use it. Don't give it up. Why? Uh, I, I mean, nobody's giving you anything. So keep the two-state solution alive. Work for it. Work for one-state solution. You want to achieve your rights through both uh, uh, courses. Uh, your, your rights are known. Right of return, uh, uh, equality, and freedom. Those are the basic rights of the Palestinian people. And so use every source of power that, that is available to you um, to, to, to push forward and not, not say, oh, well, it wasn't achieved. Why was, ask yourself, why wasn't it achieved? And uh, what would it take to achieve it? What would it take to achieve one state? It's actually basically the same uh, strategy, which is to build up your sources of power and, and address Zionism and, and uh, show uh, the the clay feet of Zionism, that the idea, the notion that people are born unequal, the notion that one country can can uh, uh, occupy and control another country, these are not acceptable in what we like to think of as the modern era. Thank you um, so much, Nadia. Hatem, I'm going to ask you two questions because they are um, related and they they are they build on um, your answer to my first uh, question. So you discussed the emergence of a progressive wing, wing within the um, Jewish American community, and there is a question about what you think the role of Jewish progressives in the U.S. Uh, should be, um, since the right wing in both parties claims to support Israel as a Jewish state. Another related question is what allies and groups advocating for Palestinian rights should the Palestinian Americans and Arab Americans ally with in order to have strong impact and to have a seat at the table? Jewish Voice for Peace, Progressive Jewish Forces, if not now, uh, and other groups that uh, I will also speak of the International Anti-Zionist Jewish Network. 
So there are a number of groups. These are very critical in relations to uh, the work for Palestine. And there's been partnerships that have been formed in order to advocate, especially uh, on policies relative to con uh, Congress, uh, legislative track, also uh, some uh, neutralizations of certain successful strategies that have been deployed by the pro-Israel forces, in particular in relations to the attack on anti-Semitism that has been used as a tool of silencing. So those are very important. More importantly, I think we need to begin to think of what is a post-Zionist Palestine horizon looks like. And that conversation does need to have to include the Palestinians and the progressive Jewish voices, and I also say the long-standing Orthodox Jewish uh, voice that have historically been constantly been pro-Palestine segment. So we need to imagine the world in a in a post-Zionist decolonial horizon, and to begin to actualize it in a collectivity to think of what are the possible ways. Uh, because if you continue to think that the reality that you that you are living today is the upper limit of your horizon, then you have accepted colonization, settler colonization as the upper limit of what you accomplish. So I do think that we need to begin to imagine that in a systematic way. And I think our conversations, alliances, and uh, engagement with the progressive uh, uh, new Jewish wing that is emerging, as well as some of our uh, partners within the Orthodox communities that have been with us for quite some time. As far as other alliances that we need to work with, I think uh, this is a long history as well. And that's why I begin from a, a longer history. Our relationship with the black community in, in the United States actually did back to the 60s. It's not surprising that Malcolm X actually is in Gaza in the 1960s. It's not surprising that the black, that the black Panther Party members actually ended up visiting and being in solidarity with the Palestinians, we ended up in Algeria, ended up in Beirut, ended up in Libya, ended up actually some went to exile into Egypt. Those are historical relationships. And if we see some of the voices of Black Lives Matter today, they are quoting Malcolm X, they're quoting Angela Davis, they're quoting some of the historical legacies in there. Similarly, those relationships with the uh, uh, pro-immigrant uh, forces in the United States. Those also relations have been forged long time. So it's not surprising that we have a solidarity movement at the wall in the Mexican border, knowing that the company that built the wall in Palestine, this, the apartheid wall, is the same company that was brought to, to build the wall on the Mexican border. And I would say from where I work on the anti-apartheid movement, it's the same company that was hired by the South African apartheid regime to build the, the wall or the fences at the time between Mozambique and South Africa as a way to stop the ANC from its continued struggle against South Africa. So these are alliances that are forged over a long period of time, navigating the domestic and the transnational, and that is at the center of the tension during the civil rights movement. Again, the critique early on on MLK that he was not engaging in the transnational and Malcolm X was engaging in the transnational, but if you read MLK in 68, 67, 68, he took on the transnational and began to be closer to Malcolm X while Malcolm X came closer to him. So I do think what we need is a longer understanding of how these relationships have been forged. And now they're beginning, I would say, to give fruits while those in the existing political leadership position, whether Democrat or Republican, are trying to continue to do and work on politics as usual responding to major funders and responding to APAC. But I do think that the future, at least in the next two cycles, the future is, looks very optimistic. Lastly, let me say that it's not surprising that Michigan right now is an important state in relations to the 2020 election. And I think even though that the new poll that came out from the Arab community that 26% are supporting uh, Trump, I understand because there's historical legacy. I think Michigan is going to play a major role. And if it does contribute to Biden's winning the election, I think that both the Arab and Muslim population in Michigan, which is substantial, will have to overplay 
its role in the new coming administration. I think with Rashid al in there, we will have a much more emboldened Arab, Palestinian, Muslim population that we begin to see that not only that you defeat uh, APAC candidates, which we did in the, uh, in the Democratic primary, but now we actually could assert that the Arab voices and Muslim voices in critical states can make a difference. So politics moving forward might be different than politics before. Thank you so much, um, Hatem. Nadia, there's a question on, um, I think it's, um, it's with you because you were a journalist. Um, so um, the mainstream media bias prevents amplifying the Palestinian voice and activism. Um, what kind of solutions uh, could you think of to penetrate this? Yeah, thank you, Noor. It's uh, it's very interesting because you see Palestinian voices increase and then disappear, increase and then disappear. It's like a wave effect. Um, even for example, at the Shabaka, uh, we had uh, uh, several years ago we we had several pieces uh, in the New York Times, and then suddenly nothing. Um, so uh, there clearly is uh, an effort to. Um, control and uh, and main, uh, keep uh, pro-Palestinian or progressive voices out of the mainstream media. Um, but, uh, you know, just as with every other issue, you persevere, you don't give it up. So first of all, uh, as, as mentioned, there is an organization now that's been around, I think, for 15 years, Institute for Middle East Understanding, IMEU, which is very important, um, and which works very, very hard to place Palestinian and pro-Palestinian voices in the media. Um, so I think when, first of all, you need to write, you need to speak. Uh, uh, and you can work on media, you can work on, on uh, traditional media at, uh, at many uh, different levels. You can work at your local level, uh, uh, your city level, your state level, uh, before you get to, to the national level. Um, so yes, there is a bias. But it's one of many biases against us, and and we have to like like for everything else, we have to organize and and work on it. And then uh, you can see that many of the stories that go into the media uh, don't necessarily need to be political. There can be about cooking. They can be about now. There's stories about Palestinian chefs uh, during the pen, the first wave of the pandemic. There were a lot of stories about um, the the uh, Palestinians and Arabs who who got meals to people who couldn't afford them. Um, you can have stories on, on literature. Now there's Palestinians, uh, you know, on, um, on major uh, uh, publication lists that uh, that uh, Palestinian uh, writers and authors, uh, you have uh, you have uh, uh, poetry, you have film. So the the point is to humanize, to take to, to prevent the dehumanization of the Palestinian and their allies uh, and other other oppressed groups and and push back and there are many many ways to humanize people not just political analysis political analysis is of course important getting into the mainstream media is of course important um, but now there is social media and what actually happens on social media on twitter especially um, but on facebook i i am a bit guilty because i don't have a very active twitter account but I, i'm hoping to change that in the recent future but Twitter imposes itself on the media. So if you can't get an article in the media, if you if you have a number of hits on Twitter, that makes it into the mainstream media. So you've got this, you know, uh, process of osmosis between all the different forms of media. So the bias is there, but the uh, the solutions and the openings for activists and dedicated activists are also there. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, um, Nadia. Hatem, there is another question on also um, action that can be taken or should be taken in the future. Um, and the question is, should our resources be directed towards the 2022 elections? And if so, which Palestinian groups can or should lead the way and identify candidates we should support across the US and focus on um, our efforts on? So should we be working with groups like Justice Democrats, brand new Congress, etc., or are there any efforts that should be uh, better directed elsewhere? Uh, I think what we need to pursue is a multifaceted strategy. Uh, but first, let me 
uh, ask and insist on people, all politics is local. Meaning that I would encourage people to begin to strategize at the local level. Uh, I would encourage people to run for uh, office themselves at the local level. I would put as much emphasis on a library board as much as on the school board, city council, regional, and so on. Uh, this is, comes from an example where often the library, you will have an event on, for Palestine and the library board will vote to actually restrict or limit or sometimes cancel. Uh, the uh, museum that having a Palestinian children art and the museum as a result of pressure removes and actually uh, unsponsor the exhibit for the children. So all politics is local. So I want you to begin to think on those terms. I know that uh, we have the propensity, uh, again, from the Arab Muslim world, is we think of Zaim, right? There is only one leader and basically he is the person and as such our politics have focused on this national figure even speaking about biden and trump biden and trump are responsible or responsive to local political landscape so all politics is local so we need as we engage at the higher level of the presidential election again i don't want you to say um, it's not important but i think what we need is to structure our relationship in that way Second, I do think that uh, we have to continue to push on college campuses. Why? Because you, this is the next generation, uh, both of leaders as well as uh, uh, thought makers in relations to society. So I encourage individuals to begin to be far more systematic in work and support for the Palestinians. Third, uh, I think the media area has been completely uh, under funded and underinvested by us uh, in relation to Palestine. This is not taking any way from the existing organizations, but the fact that we have one or two organizations that work on the media, and I know the staff they have, it's paid staff, but it's skeleton. I think what we need is major investments and the investments should be uh, structured differently. And I would, I would possibly offer the following is that we need to offer possibly fellowships where we could actually incentivize both students to study. Again, I'm trying to remedy the uh, Arab DNA and Muslim DNA marker is that either you're MD or engineer. And therefore we have to, we have to incentivize our future generation to go to fields that are not often pursued by our young people in order for us to make an impact for the long term. So a fellowship that would be sponsored, training and possibly also guaranteed of funding for two to three years where individuals can actually be engaged in there. And I would add to this also the arena, the arena of creative writing, narrative, narrative construction stories, because again, uh, even you know, thinking from a theological perspective, much of the theology we read is about narrative. So when you read the story of Abraham, you see the story of Moses, you see the story of Jesus, you don't only read the ideology, but you actually have narratives. So what we need is to actually also invest in those arenas in order to actually do a systematic change. So it's not only the 2020 election, but actually think of a most of a, a tra transform transformational investment by our own uh, organizations as well as our uh, supporters in order to understand what is needed in, in order to bring about an impact. So that's how I look at where we're, we're heading. And this, these are the things that I encourage often. It's much better for you to run and people complain about you than having somebody that's running and you complain about them. At least if they're complaining about you, you could recommend a therapist for them. But if you are the only ones complaining, then you need to be a therapist. So mm -hmm. I don't refuse to be a therapist for anyone. Thank you so, so much, Nadia and Hatem, uh, for your insights. Um, uh, this has been a very um, rewarding, insightful um, policy lab uh, for me, and I hope that the audience also found it um, helpful. You've been listening to the Palestine Podcast, a production of the Ireland Palestine Solidarity Campaign. For more podcasts like this, please visit www.ip sc.ie forward slash podcast for more news analysis events and ways in which you can take action see our website at www.ipsc.ie 
Thank you for listening, and you'll be hearing from us again soon.